Recently, we have learned about supply and demand, in which buyers and sellers come together to create a market. We've also talked about how competition in a market is important and how it leads to lower prices, more efficiency, and a greater amount of choices. Well, economists use something called market structures to identify the common characteristics of various markets and to measure how competitive they are. We're going to talk today about four market structures that range from very competitive and have very little market power to those that are, very, that are not competitive at all and have the most market power. Today, let's start by talking about perfect competition. <clears throat> now, perfect I mean, is not found in the world very often, is it? I mean, you don't find perfection very often, so you're not going to find perfect competition in its pure form very often. The basic definition is it is a large number of sellers selling identical products. By large, there's no exact amount. You might say, you know, a hundred more, something like that. And identical products means the products, it doesn't matter who sells it, you're beginning the same exact product um, regardless. Some of the characteristics that exist in a perfect competition market are that, again, there are many firms and many buyers who are selling identical products. And there is what we call perfect freedom of entry. That means in order to begin selling in this market, you'd have, you wouldn't have anything barring your way. It wouldn't, you wouldn't have to have a lot of finances or government regulation or all the various things that could stop someone from, wanting to start, from starting a business. Those things wouldn't exist. And that's part of the reason why there would be so many firms in this business. It also relies on perfect knowledge. And that really, the per perfect knowledge really refers to the consumers that they know that there are many firms and many buyers, that they know the products are identical. And if they know these things, what does this mean about the prices? Well, let's just pick an example. Let's pick the example of cucumbers. If you wanted to grow cucumbers and sell them, could you? Does it take a high level of knowledge? No. Does it take a lot of money? No. There are really no barriers preventing you from going into business selling cucumbers. So let's imagine that you did, and then you grew some cucumbers in your backyard, and you took them to the farmer's market. At the farmer's market, are you the only one selling cucumbers? I'm sure you would not be. There would be probably dozens of other um, sellers selling cucumbers there. And so what would that mean about your price? Well, I'm assuming here that the cucumbers are identical to all the other cucumbers, and that's a pretty safe assumption. One cucumber is pretty much the same as another cucumber. And so if you came in there and you set up your stand, what price could you charge? Could you charge a higher price than the other cucumber sellers at the market? No, because if you did, people would go to them instead of you. Could you charge a lower price? Perhaps, but when, as soon as someone charges a lower price, what do you think the people around them will pr probably do? Probably set a lower price as well. And so really, in a perfect competition, very quickly, the prices become the lowest they can, and there still be a profit. And so there's going to be a very small, what we call, profit margin. And really, there's no, not much wiggle room in there as far as where you can change your price. Now, of course, this again relies on that perfect knowledge, that the consumer knows that there are other cucumber sellers at the market that they could go to. If they, for some reason, didn't know that and thought you had the only cucumbers, or you could convince them your cucumbers were different in some way, it, you, it wouldn't be a perfectly competitive market anymore, and the price could be changed. Some examples. My, and again, there's no real pure examples. Agriculture is a good example, but as far as the many sellers, um, many farms have consolidated into large corp corporate farms. <clears throat> And there aren't as many sellers as there used to be. Um, and so it's not a pure example, but agriculture is a, is a good example. The currency market, that's where you buy and sell pieces of paper or currencies, like dollars, pesos, euros. If I buy a euro, one euro is the exact same as another euro. And so the price pretty much needs to be the same. Sometimes you will see slight fluctuations that exist just because of things like convenience. For example, you may have to pay a little bit more if you exchanged your dollars for euros at the airport <clears throat> versus if you went to the bank. The stock market is another example of perfect competition. 
So on our continuum, the perfect competition is our most competitive, and that means it has the least market power. Market power refers to your, your ability to influence the market and your ability to set prices. In a perfect competition, you really don't have that ability. Let's go to the other opposite extreme. Let's go to a monopoly, which is the least competitive and has the most market power. A monopoly is a market structure in which there is a single supplier of a good or service. Mono means one, so monopoly has one seller. All, in addition, there are no close substitutes to the product. Otherwise, there would be some sort of competition. So this is a product in which there's no close substitute and only one, one entity sells it. This allow The reason why there's just one seller is there are very high barriers to entry. Otherwise, more people would sell it because in each place where a profit could be had, people will, will want to enter it, that market. But there are high barriers to entry. Think of that as like a big, tall brick wall. On the other side of the brick wall is the ability to start a business, but you have to get over that brick wall first. And it's too high and it's too thick and you can't do it. Um, those high barriers to entry can be several things. One might be co just um, financial costs, um, high costs of starting a business. Some businesses are so have such a high amount of money to start it that really not many people can. There also might be government regulations. Sometimes the government can actually grant government um, sponsored monopolies um, and they through the use of licenses or um, patents. A patent is when you um, invent something, you apply for a patent, and if you receive that patent, you are the one that has the exclusive right to sell that invention. You can license it out to the companies so they can make it, but you have to get permission for that to happen. And so in that case, you have a legal monopoly on that product. This gives you a lot of market power when you have a monopoly. You can influence things and you can set prices at a higher price than they would otherwise go. Now, when you set that at a higher price, when I say you can set it at a higher price, it doesn't mean you can set it at any price. If I go to the movies, I may be willing to pay a higher price for my soda because in a way, they kind of have a monopoly for, of soda in the movie theater. I'm not allowed to bring in any, any, anything else. It's not a real monopoly, but it kind of seems like one. And so maybe I'll pay, you know, four dollars for a soda. Normally I would never do that. But if I went in there and they char tried to charge eight dollars for a soda, I might just go thirsty. And so while they have some um, control over price, they don't have absolute control because they still, people still have to want to buy it. Some examples are the local water company. This is an example of a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly exists because there are some industries in which it is actually more efficient, better for the consumer, all around, to, for there to be a monopoly, for there to be a single supplier, and water is one of them. Imagine what goes into providing water to a community. There's the laying of the pipes, right, um, which is very expensive. And once a water company has invested that amount of money and they've, they're charging for their water, um, does it, would it be financially possible for another water company to come in, lay a whole other set of pipes in order to um, charge for their water as well? It probably wouldn't work very well. Um, just the nature of having more water pipes crisscrossing and things wouldn't be good. It uh, wouldn't be very efficient. And so the water company is an example of a natural monopoly and it's, the government does look out over it and make sure they don't take advantage of that. They are often regulated so they can't just charge whatever price they want but they are a monopoly. The U.S. Post Office, now this was a strong, much stronger monopoly really um, even I would say 15, 20 years ago. It was a very strong monopoly. They have a constitutional right to be the only ones who can deliver first class mail. However, there have been some new competitors through new technology which is challenging the U.S. Post Office's monopoly namely fax machines or email or online bill pay. All of these things have eaten into the post office's monopoly and so they don't have such a strong power. They're still the only ones who can come to your house every day, they're going to bring your daily first class mail, but people aren't using it very much because they found a substitute. And finally, the NCAA, National Collegiate Association of Athletes, I think is how it goes, and they have a monopoly on college athletics. 
If you want to play college athletics, you will play for the NCAA and you will follow their rules. And so they have monopoly on that. Now we've looked at the most competitive perfect competition and the least competitive a monopoly. But those are the two extremes and most things don't follow in the extremes, most things go in the middle. And so let's talk about the middle. Let's talk about monopolistic competition. Do you see that word monopolistic? Let's divide it up. Can you see monopoly in there? Can you kind of see the part of that word in there? Can you see istic? If something is realistic, that means that it's not real, but it has many of the qualities of being real. Well, in a way, monopolistic competition is that way. It's not a monopoly, but it has some of the same qualities. Now, in this case, you have many companies competing to sell similar, but not identical products. So let's say hamburgers. Okay. If I go out into our city, I can find literally, I would say, over 100 different places where I could find a hamburger. But, and they all are very, they're all similar, they're all hamburgers, they all have two buns and a pat and the meat in the side. But, what differs between them is how they're presented, is the size, is the taste, is how healthy they are, what kind of ingredients do they use. So they're not all identical. And so Whataburger, for example, or doesn't have a monopoly on hamburgers, but it has a monopoly on the Whataburger version of a hamburger, or McDonald's doesn't have a monopoly on hamburgers, but has a monopoly on a Big Mac in that way. So that's why it's monopolistic. It's got, you can have your own unique um, product, and you can be, the, that's, or not completely unique, but your own version of the product. And it's, it's just different enough where you can get people to pay a higher price. So the characteristics are, again, there are many firms. So it's a product where lots of people sell it. There are few barriers to entry, meaning that it's still, you know, not that difficult to start this type of business. And they have what they call differentiated products. Look in the word differentiated. You see the word different there. That gives you a clue to its meaning. It's when you make your product a little different from the other products. You differentiate, you make it stand out from the crowd. And so perhaps your hamburger, you use only organic beef or never frozen meat, or your hamburgers are bigger than the competitors or your hamburgers or have leaner beef. There's lots of different ways you can differentiate a hamburger versus all the other hamburgers that are in the market. This gives you a slight control over price. And it's the reason why if I go to different burger places, I can find a burger is very cheap and I can find burgers that are much more expensive because they, they can, if they can convince you their product is worth more, you will pay more. This is called non-price competition, in which you're competing not based on the fact that you're the cheapest out there, but based on the fact that you are the best in some way. In fact, last week I heard an advertisement for SMU Business School, and their tagline, I'm not sure if this is the exact tagline, but it was something like, um, we may cost more, but we will give you, but we'll give you more. Their whole thing was the fact that even though they're not the cheapest business school out there, they give you more than all the other business schools. And so that is called non-price competition. Examples, I could come up with dozens of them. Jeans, how many different companies make jeans? And each one makes their own different version of them. Ice cream, fast food, donut shops. I mean, a lot of different things would fall into this monopolistic competition. Finally, we have an oligopoly. An oligopoly is a market structure in which a small number of firms dominate the market. That term, small number, that's key. That's what is going to make us an oligopoly. The products might be the same, they might be different, that's not the point. The point is they're just a small numbers of them. Um, we often, there, the reason why there's a small number is there are also high barriers to entry, similar to monopoly. The barriers aren't quite as high, but they're still high. Often, often there's a high cost associated with starting the business. Some economists use something called a four firm concentration ratio to figure out if an industry really is, a mono, is an oligopoly. And what that is, you take the top four firms and you add up their market share. If it adds up to more than 40%, it's an oligopoly. They can sometimes act like a monopoly. They don't like, they don't want additional competition. And so they could kind of act in a concerted effort to kind of squeeze out any newcomers. And often they can do this illegally. And if they get caught, they could even go to jail if they do things like price fixing. 
Examples would be something like cereal. Now I know when you go to the grocery store you see 50 different cereals, but look at the companies that are making those cereals. There are just four main ones. There's Kellogg's, Post, Quaker, and General Mills. And then there's some other smaller ones, but really those are the major ones. Airlines, cell phone companies, uh, by like cell phone plans like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint. Each of these industries have a small amount of businesses. Now, this often means the prices aren't going to be as low, but it, they do have to keep up with each other. So if one comes up with an idea, a new t invention, a new innovation, they all have to kind of keep up with that. And you see that happen with cell phones. That when one cell phone comes out, like the iPhone, that very quickly the other companies come up with a phone that will match the characteristics of the iPhone. So this, go, this again, market structures, goes from the most competitive to the least competitive. And the, gov the government can use this type of idea to really look at, at businesses and see how much regulation they need. Perfect competition doesn't really need much regulation because it's perfect. Monopolistic competition? Well, one area where it might need regulation is in truth and advertising. When you're differentiating your product, you still have to be truthful. Oligopolies need to be watched over to make sure they don't um, work together um, and they don't collude and, or form cartels or trusts and act like monopolies. And monopolies need to be watched to make sure that they are not preventing other companies from com either preventing other companies from from joining the industry, from competing, or if they are like a natural monopoly, that they are not using their power unfairly.